in the 70s when I was doing my psychiatry and we were taught and we used to teach students if you know schizophrenia you know all about varieties of symptomatology in psychiatry because every possible symptom you can see in a patient in schizophrenia over a period of time. What is special about this disease is if you think you know all about this disease next day you see a patient who has stumped you. You think something which is easily treatable, straightforward, this is a patient who gives you the goosebumps and say not responding. Sometimes you find very difficult presentation they respond, they simply challenge you on a daily basis. You just can't take this disease for granted. So uh, just to leave, give you an initial slide, you know about positive symptoms, negative symptoms and cognitive symptoms. I am going to leave my slide set here as it always been done. I am not one of those who believes intellectual property is a birthright of mine, it is not. It is all slides taken from here and there, but we have learned more then we pick the right one for the right audience and uh, it is something I believe a good teacher is one who shares his knowledge with everybody and not who hides it and puts it in the pocket and say I can't tell you this, take this with you. And now positive, negative and cognitive symptoms, dementia precox is what we learned first that means the symptoms of cognitive, cognitive disturbance was known way back 100 years ago. But somehow Later, only the importance was given for positive and negative symptoms. The last 20 years, we have understood the significance or importance of cognitive symptoms and schizophrenia. And you will all know by now that maybe, if not in most, if not on all patients, at least in majority of the patients, if you take the history correctly, cognitive symptoms are the first ones to strike the disease. Decline, scholastic decline, academic decline inattention, not able to concentrate. These are the symptoms that come first and that still pose a challenge despite advancement in our treatment. All of them cause functional impairment. You want to stop anywhere on the way, raise your hand anytime. So, what are the factors that affect the course and outcome of schizophrenia. Why do some people get better? Why do some others do not get better despite your best efforts? One is ineffective treatment. We do not give the correct kind of treatment, correct duration and the correct dosing. Progression and chronicity of illness and treatment resistance, persistent symptoms, partial and non adherence and treatment discontinuation. Now, what is marked in red is something which we encounter every single day, non adherence and uh, treatment discontinuation. All of them lead to relapse. There is not a single patient who has not had a relapse at least once in their life span of the disease. So, we will come to numbers later. What are the long term outcome of patients with schizophrenia? What is the reality? Only 10 to 15 percent of patients are free from further episodes. Very rarely patients have only one episode. By nature of the disease, the disease has multiple episodes that are happening through the course of the disease. Majority of them display exacerbations and show clinical deterioration. And despite all your effort, 15 even up to 20 percent of your patients, no matter what you have given them, including long acting injectables and later clozapine, they become a challenge. They remain chronically and severely psychotic and you know you are not able to do anything at all. Why? When I talk about this, I will say one third, one third, one third of the dictum generally we use, one third respond well, one third respond but they do not really get completely alright, one third remain chronic. 
But when we say we can't do much about it, we are only talking about what medication cannot do to you, to the patient. But we can do a lot with them with rehabilitation. That is another topic altogether. I am not going to dwell on it today. Early in the disease course, patient respond well. Now that is a good feeling you get. Two weeks later, symptoms have come down, patient is sleeping better and delusions are weakening, paranoid symptoms are less, is less aggressive, four to six weeks much better and you pat yourself on the back and go home and say, wow, done a fantastic job. But only to come back with a relapse. Every relapse has a clinical deterioration and we will see it soon. This is one of my favorite slides. I am sure my colleague Nilesh would have seen this over several times. Pathophysiology of early phase of schizophrenia may involve a cascade of sequential and cumulative. These are key words. Sequential and every sequential event also leads to a cumulative response in the system. Premorbid deficits, prodrome symptoms and psychosis strikes. By then the deterioration as begin to be demonstrated. Functional decline. And why does it happen? There is a genetic susceptibility and of course environmental factors, viruses, drug abuse, stress, obstetric complications, all of them contribute. And if you notice here, glutaminergic, GABA, neurotropin abnormality, this is birth, adolescence, premorbid and prodrome symptoms, adulthood, all of them seem to happen. Dopaminergic dysregulation and this is the commonest accepted theory even today, hyperdopaminergic state where majority of your positive symptoms are a result of this issue here. Neurochemical sensitization and oxidative stress, early developmental derailment, peri-adolescent brain dis dismaturation. Now for an illness to develop like schizophrenia, it is not one event and one result. There are multiple causative factors and each individual is different. I often tell my friends, if a surgeon sees 10 patients with appendicitis, and you all know most, if not all of them, will have only in McBurney's point here, right iliac fossa. You press it, you have a tenderness, you have classic symptoms. You today we used to do only clinical palpation, make a diagnosis. Today you have a scan, ultrasound, make a diagnosis, and appendix almost always is only in the right iliac fossa. Very rarely if there is an opposite side developmentally. And you can close your eyes and say it is done and done with it. But 10 schizophrenia patients, each of them are different. Each person's presentation is different. Each person's family history is different. Each person's family dynamics is different. Each person's family support is different. Lack of support is different. Same diagnosis, 10 different people, 10 different outcomes. And you don't give the same medication to the same all 10 of them. You choose depending on the presentation and psychopathology. And that is a challenge in psychiatry, which you do not see in any field of medicine. Post illness, onset neurodegeneration, this is normal development. We saw this ball going there, we are all lucky to be at this stage. I just say plain lucky, because any one of us any one of us could have developed an illness at any point in time in our lives. Now this is what happens if, if unfortunately you have been stuck with this disease and this is how the functional decline happens in this disease. Typical course, first episode, first episode patient reaches your OPD. I saw a very busy OPD in professor's department. 
20, 30 new patients, 200 patients. I'm sure all of you deal with a large number of patients in your clinical work. First episode, response is pretty decent. Response is good. Remember, patient is functioning around 90, 100%. First episode strikes here, and then there is a decline. Then this is a response. You start on antipsychotic medication of your choice, the patient starts responding. Then what happens? Then subsequently, when they have a relapse, they get partial response and they are chronic and relapsing. We were taught and we used to teach. One of the distinguishing features with what we call bipolar, what we used to call manic depressive psychosis and bipolar disease today, bipolar disease is episodic. In between episodes, they are symptomatically and functionally normal. Schizophrenia is a chronic and continuous disease. There are periods of normalcy on treatment functioning, but the disease nature is it is chronic and relapsing. Almost never they reach 100% functioning with zero deficit, very, very uncommon. So what are the factors affecting clinical outcome of schizophrenia? This is the clinical outcome. Early treatment, better response, broad range of efficiency, partial insight, drug tolerability, dosing convenience, adherence. These are all the various factors that result in either a good response or a bad clinical outcome. So for one individual to get better, to reach a level of response and even to remission, you have to have all of this drug tolerability, early treatment, all of them have to work together to get a better response. So what is non-adherence? What happens in non-adherence? When a patient is not taking medication, which is non-adherence, and the consequence of the relapse, there is a loss of self-esteem, illness may become resistant to treatment because of non-adherence, loss of functional achievement, family burden and estrangement. You know that people, I'm sure it is common here too, they don't tell the family the patient has had an illness. You get surprised when the patient relatives knock on the door and tell you, the invitation card from my daughter's wedding. I said, what wedding? Which daughter? That uh, Kirti you have been treating? Oh, is she getting married? Uh, did we discuss this? No doctor, we were told uh, by our relatives, you get her married, she'll be alright. So, patients don't take medication just before the wedding because she's a little drowsy. She stopped medication, relapse and because of which estrangement happens. Increased cost of care. Every relapse costs you more money. Potential danger to self-harm and symptomatically they can behave irrationally with others. This is very important to understand, very hard to re-establish the previous grains. I am showing, going to show you one more slide to establish this fact. Potential neurobiological sequelae. By all now, you know by all now, that schizophrenia is a brain disease. We were, when we were students, we were taught uh, there is a functional disease and an organic disease. Functional disease, schizophrenia, bipolar, I mean mainly depression. It was thought it was not a primary brain problem, but today we know very differently it is a, a brain disease. So all of these things are non-adherence and relapse can result in any one of these consequences. With every episode of relapse, there is a decline in psychosocial functioning. The premorbid state, age 10 to 15, prodromal state, slowly the decline is happening, florid phase, recovery phase, residual phase, but the patient is nowhere near what happened here. You understand? That means once an illness strikes, our task as doctors, 
our task as psychiatrists is to make sure that we retain them around this phase and not allow them to go here. Is it in our hands? Sometimes we say, oh, we can be fatalistic and say, oh, this is the disease. Whatever we can do, we can, but that's not going to happen. But I want to challenge this notion. We can do something to make sure that despite the inherent problems in this disease, we can do something and we must do something to make them hover around here and not go down here and then it's very difficult to pull them out of that state. This is one of my favorite slides. This is a prodrome, let's say this is 100% functioning, this is the age. This is sometimes I take a OPD paper and a pen and draw this to the patients and their families to explain to them what actually happens if you take medication, what happens when you do not take medication. Prodromal state, suddenly the disease strikes. Out of the blue, age 17, patient is withdrawn, smiling to himself, laughing to himself, not attending classes, locking the door up, closing the screen, somebody is watching me, somebody is putting gas through this and cameras are kept all over the house. Florid, I don't have to describe psychotic symptoms. And during the first episode, the functioning deteriorates to about 60 percent, just an average number. And there is a brain tissue loss over a period of time, I'll come to that. So patients come here to see you. You have, it's an obvious diagnosis, as a student you might present a case to the professor, says yes, diagnosis, what is the option you have? You want to treat him on antipsychotics, first generation, second generation of your choice, second generation in some patients, then you put them on antipsychotic medication. Your task at that time is to provide a dopamine blocking agent. You all know that you need a good antipsychotic action if a dopamine is blocked between 65 to 70 percent. 65 to 75 percent dopamine blocking happens, your positive symptoms respond. You block beyond that, 80, 85, you are over enthusiastic, then you start developing a lot of extrapyramidal neural, neural elliptic side effects. So the patient responds, sometimes dramatically, and then look at the response. In a matter of about few weeks, the response begins and in a, about one year's time, the patient has reached about, not here, remember, first episode treatment, he has not reached a pre-morbid stage. He has reached only up to 85, from 95 to 100 is here. You are continuing treatment, you are happy and then you say, come after now, you are doing well, come after four weeks, come after six weeks, suddenly the patient does not come to the OPD. Two months, three months, six months, no sign of the patient. And then second episode, because suddenly they come back, there is a drop and the second episode, when they come from this response, the sec by the time they come to you a second time, the deterioration has come from this first time response to 60, they have come to 50 percent only functioning. You put them on antipsychotic medication and you say, why did you not come, blah, blah, blah. Then they tell you, when the doctor is a very short tempered man, because he gets angry. They don't realize the anger is not at them, anger is the frustration in you. Look at the response quickness here, look at the protracted response here. Response is protracted. It's not quick, it takes a much longer time, but the maximum response achieved is only 70 percent second time. So from 90 to this 70, then one more relapse, then it takes double the time. If you notice, every time a patient has a relapse, the time taken to respond just keeps increasing. Six weeks response becomes three months, six months, and when they respond, 
they unfortunately go nowhere near even the not forget here even any of these locations they come here so by the time you have multiple relapses we have chronic relapsing residual symptoms and they become treatment resistant treatment resistant meaning drug management becomes absolutely inadequate and sometimes rehab is something we don't want to catch them here we want to catch them here how do we prevent relapse it's a key in the treatment of schizophrenia i used to tell students what are the three commonest reasons for relapse stopping medication second reason discontinuing medication third not taking medication the famous dictum in medicine a treated cold lasts for one week an untreated cold lasts for seven days. seven days right so it's like that so one of the commonest reasons is stopping medication treatment discontinuation increases the relapse risk by five fold five times increase the chances of relapse decreases if pharma pharmacotherapy is continued other risk factors are if there is substance abuse alcohol abuse poor insight if it persists if the patient has poor insight lack of insight persisting through the years any time in their life span they will stop treatment relapse prevention strategies should ensure periods of non adherence are minimized stopping medication is a most powerful predictor survival analysis is first episode the chance of relapse is 4.89% second relapse is nearly little less than that that means at every relapse there is a chance for a further relapse the other unfortunate part of it is you treat them well they become relatively symptom free they become functional you caught them early that there is another flip side to that i am all right now why should i take medication they just don't seem to get it and it's a challenge which you face every single day the challenge you face is because you are struggling to swim upstream not against the patient against the family family's relatives family's uncle aunts who live in the usa and say you know we have been told that you should not take this medic phone has come from usa or there are several agni aunts who are famous for writing in those infamous magazines don't take medication these are addictive and of course within our psychiatric community i can talk one of the most dangerous set of people who work against your interest and your patient interest are our own medical colleagues i'm sure all of you have had enough share of battling with that until somebody in their family has a problem even then they stop it they come back running to you because you can't do anything more about it <coughs> first episode patients are with a very high risk <coughs> high relapse rate within 5 years after the first episode risk of relapse in 24 54% within the first 2 years within 5 years the risk of relapse is 82% and after 5 years around the same time that means anywhere down the history there is almost always a patient who is having a relapse i have been in psychiatry for 45 years plus i am yet to see a patient who has not had a relapse at least once talking about 70s 80s 90s 2010 now even now they simply do not take medication how soon can it happen even if you don't take medication for 10 days relapse can happen relapse can happen within a week of stopping medication we will also notice there are patients who do well for 2 3 months after stopping medication 
They come to you after six months with a relapse. You have no idea why they have not relapsed for the first five and a half months. They become complacent. But there are those who get a relapse within 10 to 15 days of stopping medication. And these people, every time they stop medication for 10 to 15 days, they will get a relapse. There is something internal triggering there which doesn't permit them to be drug free even for a few weeks. And they keep getting relapses again and again. So what, what do we mean by adherence? The extent to which a person's behavior of taking medication or following a diet or executive lifestyle changes correspond with agreed recommendation from a healthcare provider. That is adherence. Adherence is not only about taking medication, following. Let me just ask this question to this young lot. How many of you are on a diet? Such young, healthy, fit people I have not come across in my life. Fantastic. How many of you are doing exercise every day, at least want to do exercise every day. You are half-heartedly raising your four fingers. No? You are talking to him or you? Yes. Sir. Yes. So, whatever we want to do, are we doing it to the... How many of you have been given antibiotic for a pharyngitis with a streptococcal infection? It says antibiotic of five days. How many of you have not completed the course? Truth. Honest. You feel better. Third day, I'm able to swallow. It's no pain. You go to the mirror and see. In a way, you can't see a spot when you open your mirror, tongue in the mirror. Feeling better. And you stop. And you want them to take medication. In instances, lifelong. So, non-adherence is a norm is a, not an X, is what most people do. So what kind of non-adherence can be there? Full non-adherence or complete non-compliance with any instructions. Take medication two times a day, exercise, bathe every day, get up in the morning, brush your teeth. You know these things will actually tell some of your patients. Total non-adherence, any instruction. Selective non-adherence, taking only one or two prescribed medication. You give them two different type of tablets, two times, three times a day, and they pick and choose which one to take, which one not to take. Selective non-adherence. Late adherence or followed by later, late adherence or non-adherence or initial non-compliance followed by later adherence. That means they choose when to take, when not to take, as and when they please. Start taking it, discontinue. They come back after three weeks, First 10 days I did not take the medication because I have been thinking and I went and consulted another doctor. And which is the most common doctor to whom they go and consult? Doctor? Google. You don't have doctor Google in Mumbai? Oh, there are plenty hovering around in Bangalore. Doctor Google. Doctor Google tells you symptoms, they didn't talk about you. So, we don't want to take medication. Abuse, more than giving prescribed medication, sometimes it benzodiazepines, more than what is prescribed. Behavioral non-adherence with any other instruction you give along with medication to be followed, they don't follow. So non-adherence can be of variety of things. Why is it still a challenge? Non-adherence is more common than treatment refusal. When you talk to the patient about taking medication or giving a plan, they will say yes, 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 we will, we will take it. They decided by then, no point in arguing with this fellow. You will keep on asking me to take the medication. So you want me to tell you, I will take it, I will take it. Go back and don't even go to the medical shop, don't even buy the medication. So non-adherence is more common than treatment refusal. Very rarely they will tell you bluntly in your face, I don't want to take medication, I am not going to take it. That's very rare. But most often they want to tell things to please the doctor. Medication is improved, safety and tolerability have not improved. Less side effects, less neuroleptic side effects medications like second generation antipsychotics, 
So I've actually not improved the adherence rates at all. The difference is very minimal. Uh, sometimes healthcare providers they think anyway, anyway they won't take medication. Let us see uh, whatever we can tell them to do. They will not do what we tell them to do. They accept it. When you accept that kind of a thing in your mind, that message gets across to the family and the patients. You may not verbalize it, but your body language uh, conveys it. Partial adherence may be perceived as inevitable and unavoidable by healthcare practitioners. I think we have to be clear about what is necessary. Adherence rates in schizophrenia, uh, 50% and 75% first and second years. One year after discharge, 50% of the patients do not fully adhere to antipsychotic treatment. We have seen this. Majority of the patients who discontinue, they say, without medical supervision. They don't come and tell you they are discontinued. They go, take it, and then. And sometimes the fault is with us. I remember very early in my student days, I wrote a prescription, I think, for a patient with epilepsy, antipsychotic medic anti-epileptic medication. In those days we had only two, <coughs> phenobarbital and diphenyl identine. I wrote one tablet two times a day for three months. The patient took it for three months. Came back six months later with severe uh, seizures. I said, why did you stop? I said, you wrote for three months. So a lesson learned. I did not specify at the end of three months you have to come and do not discontinue medication until I meet you. Simple instruction, instruction taken for granted. We do the same thing with antipsychotic medication. Six weeks, two months. You must spend as much time to instruct about the need to come if for some reason you are not able to come continue the medication, if those instructions are not given, they, you told me to take it for two months, I took it for two months, I became well in six months, I stopped the medication. You get angry with the patient, but you actually have to be angry with yourselves. So I think we have to be clear in our communication. Naturalistic study of patients at VA hospital began oral medication Still on original medication, only 27 percent, only one fourth of them are on medication despite follow up and 75 percent along the way they have dropped off. Why is power compliance is a major problem? First of all, denial of, I don't have a disease, lack of insight. If I don't have an illness, why will I take medication? I mean, you're asking me to take for a disease, for an illness, which I don't believe I have, and you think I have it, I think I don't have it. Will you take treatment for renal impairment? You don't have renal impairment, will you take it? You don't have it. So why do you expect him to take it? And that is a challenge that we have to face every day. Cognitive impairment, they have, a, you know, cognitive impairment, frontal lobe deficits they have, Hypofrontality is a term we use here, as you know. Memory functions, the executive frontal lobe functions, they are deficient and they forget to take medication. Negative symptoms, lack of initiative, lack of motivation. I am already am in bed. I do not want to get up, go to the next room, take a tablet and put it in my mouth. Side effects of medication. When I take this medication, I bloat up. I feel heavy. I feel stiff. Chaotic lifestyle with substance abuse. And because of all of this, patients do not take treatment regularly. What are the various types of non-adherence? These are things which are common exercise, flossing, dental flossing. 
By the way, how many of you do flossing? The dentist would be delighted to hear this <laughs> news. I don't think anybody wants to go and see a dentist by choice. Unless it's unbearable in the middle of the night. You make up your mind and somebody says, take a club and bite it. Take a club and bite it. Next morning you feel better. Ah, I will see later. Dentists tell you, brush your teeth two times a day, you floss every day. Hypertension, diabetes, insulin dependent, oral medication, depression, rheumatoid arthritis, bronchial asthma, streptococcal sore throat, birth control pills, God help them. They discover a bit too late. And I believe there are, these days in Malaysia, I believe there are tablets called tomorrow or happy next day or whatever name they are called. If the happy next day fails, sad three months. <coughs> In all of them, the adherence rate is only this much. Weight reduction, which is the worst of the lot, and schizophrenia is right on the top. So, exercise, 91 percent. They are all non-adherence, remember, they are all adherence here. Non-adherence is 96 percent, 90 percent in schizophrenia. Depression is about 50 percent, one, one, you know, every two patients, every other patient. So, non-adherence is a norm, but here we are concerned about what happens if your patient with schizophrenia is non-adherent. What are the reasons? Reasons can be complex, treatment related, side effects, poor efficiency, lack of clinical awareness, com complexity of regime. Please take this tablet three times a day. This one is after breakfast, that is after dinner, but that one is before dinner. So already this fellow has decided by the sentence to help with you. Then second medication, this one in the morning, this is in the afternoon. Sir, after or, after or before lunch, by then you are fed up, is it? Take it any time you want. <laughs> and one more tablet in the night. Two antipsychotics, one benzodiazepine, one hypnotic. And if you are that way inclined, one multivitamin, uh, which makes your urine yellow, fantastic. And you flush it out, 90 percent is anyway passed out. The only two people benefit with multivitamin therapy when you do not have any deficiency is your BMC because it all goes into the drain and the pharma company. Ouch. If the shirt is torn, I'm going to charge you for it. <laughs> Nilesh, you escaped. Thanks. <laughs> anyway, I'll borrow one of his lovely colorful shirts. So, complicated regime, poor therapeutic alliance. Why some doctors, patients take medication more regularly than some others? You take it here, I am telling you, you think I don't know. How many years you know I have studied, what do you know about this medication? Take it or no? So, the philosophy, if the doctor is going to shout it, I am not going to take it. We are the only speciality in medicine who will tell our patient, please take the medication. <laughs> Have you seen physicians saying this? A cardiologist saying this? Diabetologist? We are the only ones who will beg our patients to take treatment. Please take it here, yeah, don't stop it, please, please. Very strange speciality because stranger patients. No other speciality will request Big plead. Access to treatment. If they are coming far away, they have no access to psychiatric treatment and the cost of travel, medication. If one patient has to come, two, three attenders have to come, so problems. Psychological stigma, of course, I don't want to be seen in a psychiatric OPD. I used to do private practice in a place where the very prominent Kurgi gentleman was a very well known surgeon in the town in Bangalore. So when Kurgi patients used to see me, they will say, 
doctor, is there any other clinic where I can see you? Because there are only two rooms for OPD there, the surgeons and mine. And every Kyurgi knew every other Kurgi patient, person because it's a very small community. Oh, you are that aunt's related to brother-in-law's neighbor, no? So go, go in the over. So they will say, don't. Can I see you somewhere else? Because they don't want to be seen entering into the surgeon's room. So waiting. So the surgeon will come out for a smoke. What is he sitting here for? No, he come to see the psychiatrist. They don't want to say that. So, lack of support, lack of support, irregular routine, substance abuse, disease related, poor insight, severe to the disease, cognitive impairment, motivational deficits, human nature, we just discussed it. So, this is a very complex story. <coughs> Factors affecting, lack of insight is a very common thing. This is a common denominator in several of these issues. What happens in your brain if you don't take medication? There are progressive MRI changes over three relapses in a male with schizophrenia, actual patient pictures. First psychotic episode, second psychotic episode, look at the ventricular size, third psychotic episode. The ventricular size is ballooned out almost like what you will see in a very grossly cognitively deficient patient demonstrating dementia. Large ventricles. So this is a, a demonstrable evidence how brain is uh, severely compromised. Schematic representation again. First episode, second episode, third episode, fourth episode. Ventricular enlargement and power outcome. Longer duration of treatment versus the less ventricular enlargement over a period of time. If you are untreated, this is what you end up with several relapses. Which factor do you think has the greatest impact on medication non adherence? If you ask the patients, they say, I don't take medication because the treatment is not effective. I can't manage side effects. Uh, he has no insight, therefore he doesn't take treatment. They manage side effects their own way by either smoking or drinking. If you ask the carers, the family members, they say, what are the first thing they want? Is effective enough antipsychotic treatment? They want better insight so that it's easier for them to administer treatment, support from the carers. Psychiatrists feel if the patient must have insight, then is Adherence will become much better. Side effects must be minimal. That's what we want for the patients. Negative expectations because sometimes they want the patient to achieve pre-morbid level of functioning uh, in all patients. It's sometimes very, very difficult to achieve. So bring down the expectations, effectiveness of antipsychotic treatment. These are the different ways these are perceived by patients, caregivers and psychiatrists. So, if you want to achieve, we have to look for three R's. You have to look at recovery, remission and response. And you avoid relapse, partial response and refractiveness. So, are there any strategies to assess adherence? So, let me ask this now question to those two young ladies who are having a very interesting conversation in the last row. Yes, those two. One with a white coat, one with a red dress. Yes. Thank you. What percentage of your patients for whom you are treating with schizophrenia are, who do you say, are adherent? Your experience. Which year are you? Second. What percentage of patients do you think are adherent? Patients with schizophrenia? About 30 to 50. 30 to 50%. You? Less than 10%. Less than 10% with schizophrenia. Any other figures? Anybody? More than 80%? Raise your hands. 70 and above? 50 and above? Non-adherent. 50 and above? Non-adherent. Not adherent. Not taking medication. 70% and above? Sometime in their course of the disease. Large number don't take medication. 
So how do we ensure that you can have a direct medication observation? Drug plasma levels, I don't know whether you do drug plasma levels here, do you do? No, we don't do that. Measuring a biological marker, indirect patient self-report, patient questionnaire, maintaining a diary, pill count, refill data, electronic monitoring, none of them are accurate. Patients have this MIMS, electronic monitoring, they open it and close it, take the pill out, it's not going inside. One of the teachers did a work in somewhere I think in Denmark, so there was a ward of patients those days about 20 years ago, uh, like a large hall like this, one side there were beds and this side there were other beds like a dormitory for patients. This had windows, this had no windows. The nurse would come and give them haloperidol, 2 milligram, 5 milligram, 10 milligram every day to 10 patients on this side, another 10 patients on this side. And after about 6 weeks they found, they opened the window and found below the window on the first floor there were flower beds. All the flowers were blooming on this side because all haloperidol went out of the window. They will keep it, you know, patients can so they said after the end of six weeks, haloperidol, the study said haloperidol is very good for flower production because they were all throwing the tablets out. What are the interventions one can do to improve your adherence? Psychosocial pharmacological intervention. Cognitive behavior therapy, cognitive adaptation, more frequent, more frequent visits, patient and family psychoeducation, symptom side effects monitoring more frequently. Pharmacological dose reduction to reduce side effects. Most antipsychotics you know have more than 24 hour half life. Try and make it one dosage at bedtime. Multiple complicated dosing, chances are they will not take. Simplified regime. How many of your patients, now let's see this interesting question, let me ask this young doctor here. How many of our patients who have, you have been treating with schizophrenia in your department, what percentage of them are on long acting injectables? No, no, I am not asking about cost factor. How many of you feel? that long acting, usage of long acting injectables for treatment of schizophrenia. Let's say first generation, first generation long acting injectables. What is this usage? Any, how many of you think it is less than 10 percent? Raise your hands. How many of you think the usage is more than 20 percent? More than 30 percent? More than 50 percent? You have not raised your hands at all for 10 percent. So, I am assuming you are giving 70 percent long acting injectables. No? Let me, let, let me rephrase it. How many of you think usage of long acting injectables is less than 20 percent? Usage of LAI less than 20 percent. Oh, practically all of you. So if relapse is so common, if medication patients do not take it, why is that we are not using more of LAIs? Any reason? Yes. Correct. So the, these are the things, sir. Even uh, in our institution, sir, for the long acting also, they are saying ki why consta because we have to come for 15 days, that is bothersome. stuff. So why not pentiperidone? Sometimes availability is even difficult in institutions like us when we have plenty. But do you think more usage of LA is necessary? Uh, we feel, sir, because uh, at 
parents have gone up even the uh, symptomatically also they are much better many of them exactly if you use long acting injectables adherence is better because avoiding one of the major reasons for non adherence is not taking pills every day so long acting injectables first generation or second generation we somehow use less than what is required i understand second generation respiridone will uh, respiridol consta once in 15 days cold chain is necessary uh, once in 15 days paliperidone once a month cost is more but no cold chain is necessary but if you look at it that cost is only 300 rupees a day i say this is less than a movie and popcorn but the advantages of any long acting injectable is less relapse less cost more functioning and therefore the family members are also are relieved to see the improvement pharmacological improvement assured delivery improved tolerability over depo injections patient attendance the depo clinic can be monitored long acting injectable is a distinct advantage alternate injection sites can be discovered can be given factors associated with treatment discontinuation reasons are higher poor treatment response depressive symptoms poor illness remission status reached i have become better therefore i am not taking treatment treatment discontinuation all of them result in poor adherence this is a study done by famous dr kane in 2006 depo formulations have a distinct advantages over oral counterparts in long term treatment most of our patients need long term treatment and at any given time when you see a patient for the first time with schizophrenia you have no clue whether the person is going to have next episode or not chances are very high flufenazine decanovate and flufenazine oral this is decanovate this is oral over a period of time patients on decanovate continue to remain well whereas with oral they have dropped this kind of a gap in response is been shown in first generation and second generation studies consistently over several years predictors of poor outcome we have this dealt with this before what is the modifiable factor here longer duration of untreated psychosis that means the patient is on no treatment for a long period of time dup then the response becomes rather poor poor medication adherence these are modifiable factors this you can't do anything about it poor pre morbid adjustment male sex early onset reduced brain volume cognitive impairment inherent refractiveness of the disease it is not in your hands but this is something you can and you must do i ask myself if you have a patient in your family who has schizophrenia will you do anything at all to make sure he or she does not have a relapse yes or no yes why is that we will not do the same thing to our patients why should they be any different if there are new year medication for a cancer breast treatment for your aunt will you go ahead and do it you will why would you not do the same thing for schizophrenia why would you allow it to become chronic and then damage the brain think about it look at the relapse rates of these various studies 6 months 53% 12 months 97% in the study by 24 months 94 96% people have had relapse the bottom line is no matter what it's a disease which is going to relapse 
it is in your hands to make sure that you do not allow the relapse to happen which is under your care <coughs> sorry respiratory long acting injectable versus oral antipsychotics post hoc comparison of two studies this is oral ai this is oral antipsychotics discontinuation rates less here pans improvement more in long acting remission rates are more relapse rates are less so clearly antipsychotic long acting injectables have a big role to play why do people not prescribe long acting injectables this is the reason given by several doctors high eps rate many people think long acting injectables have a very high eps rate it is not necessarily so sufficient comparable to oral medication and patients some doctors tell us i don't know about your patients my patients listen to me when i tell them to take it they take it on the fact is not even one third have taken the medication when they were followed up not applicable cost of the drug patients needs antipsychotic not available as depo but use the depo that is available more side effects than oral formulation not necessarily true i do not want to control my patients some doctors think by giving injection you are controlling them no you are actually making them better there was a study which said how many patients were even offered the option of oral antipsychotics not even one third when they need long acting injectables not even one third of your patient you have talked to them and say look this person has had two relapses symptoms still persisting 27 years old not completed his education he dropped out of the job can we discuss long acting injectable options you have not even spent time discussing it so how will they take it sufficient compliance with medication that's what many doctors felt but 25% has stopped within one week 50% stopped within one year 80% stopped within 3 years depo recommended but patients refused when the patients went out of the hospital they inquired to the patient they said we have not even asked we did not even know such an option is available to us when i see sometimes patients coming for second opinion third opinion sometimes i ask them look have you heard of this long acting injectable said, what what injectable what is that you take an injection once a month once in two weeks once in three weeks once in four weeks depending on the choice we did not know these medicines can be given in the injectable form at all no one told us so we are not even bringing this discussion on the table to these patients to use a strong word i think we are doing disservice to these patients because if you think your family member deserves the best treatment option i think they deserve the best that is available two year outcome with consta completed full remission maintained at the end of two years 72% completed full remission achieved at 64% and maintained at the end of 2 years 62% this is a study by robert elmsley from south africa 62% at the end of 2 years they achieved complete uh, remission relapse rate at the end of 2 years now of all the patients in the same study when they were free of symptoms for 2 years i actually dr mc had come for a lecture i had discussed this with him at the end of 2 years all 172 patient they were all on respiratory consta the study was in uh, 
All 172 of the patients were asked at the end of two years, fully remitted, functioning, back to college, back to studying, back to working, back to doing everything they were doing before, not recovery, remission. 172 patients were asked, they were given a choice. Would you like to continue this treatment or not? What do you think was the answer? Anybody guess? What, how many of them said they want to continue? What percentage? None. We had a chat before we came here. Right. Not even a single patient. All 172 of them said, we will discontinue treatment. You have been well. You had a psychotic disease. You had schizophrenia. And even they know what will happen if we discontinue treatment. All of them said, I will stop treatment. I want to stop treatment. So, Dr. Emsley decided he will stop the treatment. Anybody would like to tell me what is the next slide? What happened next? Like in the episode, next episode, next week. What happened next? Huh? Relapse. Look at that. 94% relapse rate. Median time to relapse is 15 weeks. Some of them relapsed immediately, within 10 weeks. By the end of 80 weeks, one and a half years, 94% of them have relapsed. How tragic can this be? You get them all right and they come back. And remember the earlier slide, every relapse there is a brain damage. And relapses can occur without any warning. There are patients who are on regular medication and still they relapse because the other psychosocial impinging factors that override your medication adherence. So medication adherence alone is not the factor, although it's a very big factor. What components of brain tissue are lost in schizophrenia? During a psychotic relapse. There is a microscopic evidence. Your dendrite length is reduced by 50%. The number of size of dendritic spines get reduced. The size of contraction of neurite extension is reduced, reduction in the number of glial cells. Now, this is what happens in the brain of people who have relapses. There is a clear, physical, demonstrable evidence. Look at this. Normal dendrite with a fantastic spine. Very rich. Look at this. This is what is happening in your patients. Imagine this is happening across your brain structure. Are you surprised they are suffering the way they are suffering? This is what happens. There is clear evidence in this. Combination of strategies, education, behavior and cognitive, psychosocial treatment promote functional recovery, I will not go into the details, it is a different topic, a big topic in its own right, but suffice it to say, social skills training, cognitive behavior therapy, cognitive remediation, social cognition, all of them play a very big role. So going back to the earlier story, second one third of the patient with schizophrenia, the third one third of the patient with schizophrenia, despite whatever they have happened in the disease in the brain, this alone will make them move forward, not your bombardment with various other medication. Remember, long-acting injectables is not for refractive disease. Catch them early. Sometimes we use long-acting injectables in the first episode because they don't want further episodes to come. Sometimes people use expensive injections for refractive patients. They don't respond. They say, oh, this medicine is useless. 
wrong choice. That's the, that's the case for clozapine. Psychosocial interventions, lower elapse rate, reduce expressed emotions, enhance medication compliance, Psychoeducation is very essential for individual families and parents or caretakers. And a combination of all this along with the medication adherence makes a huge difference in the functional outcome. So in conclusion, gray matter decreases progressively across the course of schizophrenia. Progression of frontal tissue loss is related to number of psychotic episode. Every episode there is a further loss in frontal tissue. Adherence has poor adherence tenfold increase in risk of relapse. Each successive relapse reduces the likelihood of full recovery and full functioning. Appropriate intervention is important early in the disease course before complications versus chronicity become established. Psychiatrists seem to use injectable formulations in a very conservative way. It's a very mild term. How many of you think when you go out of this room, you'll probably consider the option of using long active injection of your choice, patient's acceptance and the family's affordability. How many of you will start doing it? Excellent. I think you should start using it. It's not necessarily that only an expensive injection. You have other relatively cheaper but effective flupenthic salt, clopenthic salts are available. Professor also knows we have experienced patients who are on medication but adherent but not improving but there is some issue about absorption. So injectable route gives a better uh, brain, blood brain barrier options for them to respond better. So every time you discuss see a patient say not responding ask yourself, hey, is there something else? Maybe you put a memory card in front of your table. Option, long acting injectable, discuss with patients and families. You will do them a big service. None of those long acting injectables have any stake in it, have no shares in that. Please remember, I am only talking for the benefit of the patients. Recent consensus concluded LIA antipsychotics could be used earlier in the course of the disease to promote adherence and prevent, which meant I said, sometimes you even think of options. I have used it in the first episode, patients. What are the key points? Antipsychotic medication is critical in the prevention of relapse. Rates of non-adherence are very high. Long-acting formulations can be a powerful strategy. Patients should be offered the option of long-acting antipsychotic treatment. You should understand the logistics. Communication strategies can be used. This I picked it up from a journal which was released two days ago. Yesterday I was browsing through Kane 2019. I mean everybody is talking about the same thing again and again and again. Why? Because this is a an issue which is burning and this is something doable. All right, this is one of my favorites, last slide. This is a little true story. Uh, I had gone to Kenya to meet somebody and then that patient's mother came to talk to me. We were having lunch and she said, I want to tell you a story doctor. A relative of hers is a psychiatrist, is a medical doctor working in Saudi Arabia. He and his friend, about 30 years ago, I'm talking about this happened about 10 years ago, I'm talking about 30 years back at that time. <coughs> they were living in an island in a place called Zanzibar in Africa, in the coast. So this doctor went and they used to play together. The boy was in a mental asylum. And they said, I want to go and meet my classmate. When they were together in school, playing football, jumping compound walls and plucking mangoes, having fun of adolescents. I want to go back and meet him and see how he is. This lady told this story. I was having lunch. I heard the story and I got choked about what she said. And um, I borrowed a 
napkin from the waiter and I took a pen, borrowed a pen and wrote down what she said. I asked her, do you have your permission to use this for my teaching? So that I want to quickly note down, made into slides and made into a small video. Just listen to the story of this young man. Can you read it? That, ladies and gentlemen, is schizophrenia. They don't ask to be sick. He was admitted in the asylum. The parents were so ashamed, they left the town and went to a different town. The father forced the mother. The mother did not want to go. He was stuck in an asylum for 30 years. He's still probably there. When his friend went and asked him, how are you? He said, ask ma'am. Any message for your parents? This is a message. I did not ask to be sick. Why did they abandon me? Ladies and gentlemen, let us not abandon our patients. Give them the best. Thank you.